Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 438 of Linux in the Hamshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the Internet. And episode 438 is our short topics episode. So stand by for amateur radio topics, open source topics, and topics that blend the two topics together for Linux in the Hamshack. And at the end, we'll have our social media roundup, so stay tuned for that. But let's go ahead and get into it. And before we do that, we generally introduce ourselves, unless I forget. But guess what? I didn't forget today. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD. Oh, yes. And uh, it's going to be belated for anyone who's not listening to us live. But happy Halloween. Happy, uh... <laughs> Is this is this all Hallow's Eve or is that yesterday? That no. was yesterday, be today, right? Is no. it today? Well, no, because tomorrow's all. Wait, uh, I'm all no, confused. No, actually, I think <laughs> tomorrow's I, all Saints Day. Yeah, yeah. So it's all Hallow's Eve today. Yeah. All Saints Day tomorrow. Also Dia de los Muertos, and right. all kinds of cool stuff. So yeah, yeah. We're in this time continuum here, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. We do not have a lead topic for tonight because we're recording this on a weird night and it's just been one of those weekends, I guess. But we will start with amateur radio and Bill has a really, really, really long short topic. <laughs> amateur radio. So uh, we'll let him go ahead and slog his way through this one. Yeah, yeah. This was just uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting read. So I'll just give you the first couple paragraphs here. But uh, yeah, can radio really educate? And it was uh, mid nineteen twenty two, and America was in the midst of the radio craze. Commercial broadcasts, uh, commercial broadcasting had emerged in a handful of cities in nineteen twenty. But at that time, a few people had a receiving set, except for amateur radio operators, who knew how to build one. It wasn't even called radio back then. Newspapers referred to it as radio phone or wireless telephone. But only two years later, there were several hundred radio stations on the air, and you could purchase a radio in the store, although hobbyists still had fun trying to build their own with varying degrees of success. Meanwhile, the word radio had become a common term for that wonderful new invention that everyone wanted in their home. Today, we take a radio for granted. It is one of the many ways to hear music, news, sports, or amateur radio. I added that one. <laughs> but in 1922, the radio was unique. It was the first mass medium to take people to an event in real time, and listeners were amazed by it. Suddenly, they could hear a popular orchestra coming through the radio set without leaving their home. They could listen to a baseball game or an inspirational talk from a preacher. Some stations even had the latest news headlines. In an era when traveling from one city to another could take hours, the popular Model T Ford had a top speed of 40 to 45 miles per hour, and superhighways had not yet come along. Listeners could travel by radio, hearing stations from distant cities. Before radio, only the wealthy could attend the uh, concert featuring a famous vocalist, but now anyone who had a receiving set could hear that singer's music. And in an America that was still racially segregated, radio gave some musicians of color the opportunity to be heard. And I got to turn my phone off because it's making a noise. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, opportunity of uh, segregate radio gave the musicians of color the opportunity to be heard by thousands of listeners in magazines and newspapers. Radio inspired utopian hopes and bold predications, predictions, sorry, pred predictions. <laughs> I was going to make a new word out of that. Uh, writers refer to it as a cure for the loneliness, especially for people living in rural areas or on the farm. And it continues to go on and on and on. And this came from JSTOR Daily. And, uh, yeah, I just, I just enjoyed the article so much. And since it did mention amateur radio, I figured I would lead off with this topic because radio, sometimes we do take it for granted, especially when we just plug our computers into it and forget the fact that we have a microphone and, you know, a little, little key next to it, maybe if you're lucky and know how to use it and can interact with the radio in a more human fashion. But, uh, yeah, can radio really educate? I think it still has plenty of potential to. I think so. Any way that you can transmit information has the potential to be able to educate, for sure. And there still is radio, including, like, broadcast terrestrial radio, which a lot of people hate because it's mostly commercials anymore. But, you know, it still exists. 
I still enjoy listening to games rather than watching games on TV. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> just, yeah, I just uh, I, I like the uh, play-by-play action instead of the commentary and like you know how most of the newscasters or whatever sportscasters just sit there and talk about how smart they are. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of true. I do I do like the visuals of the game. However, I I do still listen to games when I'm not available to have a TV handy or a, a small screen like a phone or something like that. And I will say that. The broadcasters who do radio have perfected the art, sort of, of painting pictures with words, which is nice to hear. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very visual, even though it's not. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Very cool. So let's move on. We have something about cell phones, actually, but this does involve amateur radio tangentially as well. Experts seek effective spectrum management for 5G deployment. Experts in the telecom sector have called for effective understanding of spectrum management is very key. Have called for effective understand. Okay, that's I apparently cut that really weird. So <laughs> anyway, uh, to the smooth deployment of fifth generation or 5G mobile technology, the telecom experts who gathered at a five day virtual masterclass organized by Tech Consult, a consulting firm, brainstormed on the challenges and opportunities of 5G in Nigeria and Africa at large. This this does actually get a little more global. Um, CEO of Tech Consult, Shola Taylor, said effective spectrum management is the panacea to world's smooth running of today's ICT landscape the world over. Panacea. It's going to fix everything? Okay. <laughs> COVID-2? Spectrum is the, uh, <laughs> quote, quoting uh, Shola. I, I have no idea if Shola is a man or a woman, so I'm not going to go with pronouns unless it comes up later in the article. Spectrum is the oxygen of the ICT world today, and efficiency is the key for spectrum managers. Thus, they need to be fully skilled to allocate the scarce resources efficiently, end quote. Participants rated the masterclass excellent, citing how it helps their day-to-day assignments. According to Deputy Director ICT at Pura Gambia, Rodine Renner, again, no idea, man or woman, the training is the spectrum manager's one-stop shop training program. Taylor, who was the lead facilitator, said it has become pertinent to have such knowledge on impact on the sector at a time like this when 5G spectrum licensing is around the corner, adding that, quote, auctions have increasingly become the most transparent method of awarding spectrum licenses with benefits to consumers, governments, regulators, and society at large, end quote. Industry speakers at the event included MTN Group South Africa, European Broadcasting Union, Inmarsat UK, the International Amateur Radio Union, and Libya Soft Technologies USA, technocrats who are the custodians of spectrum management across Africa, Asia, Europe, the Pacific, and USA. Why don't they just say the world? <laughs> I think they pretty <laughs> much covered it, except for Antarctica, I suppose. Antarctica, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the Arctic or something like that. The Arctic Circle. Exactly. So anyway, that story came from Leadership Nigeria. So we have to go so far afield to stay away from Southgate at this point. It's just like... <laughs> I was looking at stories from, like, the Philippines and Nigeria and, and just, like, you know, because everything else is already at Southgate. So, um, yeah, maybe, we don't want to become put the Southgate our, podcast. Yeah. Maybe we should have that as a tagline. We're not Southgate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Cheryl, do you want to read a story? This is the shortest one. So, and I, I think I actually cut it where it's readable. Um, maybe. Well, if or, not, it's not going to be any worse than normal, so. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's it's fairly short. So, okay, so our next story is Russia-Ukraine, quote-unquote, radio war, trying patience of IARU Region 1 monitoring system. The International Radio, <clears throat> excuse me, the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 monitoring system reports the September issue uh, newsletter that the Russian-Ukrainian radio war on and around uh, 7055 kilohertz continues to be a major source of frustration. Uh, Region 1 coordinator Peter Jost, HB9CET, said the on-air conflict has been bothering us to an unbearable extent for a very long time and is still continuing. Earlier this year, they reported that the Russian-Ukrainian radio war had escalated. In June, they used more frequencies than before, affecting our bands very hard, Jost recounted. It's a great annoyance and a big shame. He pointed out that the uh, monitoring system has little opportunity to stop the on-air conflict. 
Uh, to quote, only national authorities can hopefully do something against air national complaints, he said. It's very important and very helpful that many other IARU member societies also observe these frequencies and make complaints to the regulators. This long-standing conflict has also affected 7050 and 7060 kilohertz. And that information came from ARRL. Yes, because 7055 is squarely in the amateur radio CW portion. So... It doesn't really say what the issue is. Does anyone know what the issue is? Oh, yeah. I mean, I <laughs> no. assume it's like broadcast stations in that area, maybe. I'll look or, it up. Okay, you can look that up while we move on to open source. Open source. Cool stuff. And I'll go ahead and read this one because I plugged this one in here. And uh, Bill can, can work through the the wordplay in the next story so to see <laughs> we're gonna see how good bill is at painting a picture with words uh when we get to the next story <laughs> uh but this first one is pocket satellites made in greece the nonprofit organization libre space foundation was founded in 2015 it designs and develops space technology with the use of open software and has a lab in the center of athens in the hackerspace.greece community space or .gr the team's base core comprises mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, software designers, and physicists who are surrounded and supported by a team of volunteers. They construct Pico, they constructed rather Pico Bus, a metal box that integrates with a launch vehicle. This box fits up to eight Pico satellites to be released into space. At the same time, they constructed Cubic Dash One and Cubic Dash Two, two open source software Pico satellites whose objective is to identify satellites as soon as possible after deployment. Another four Pico satellites were integrated into Pico Bus, Genesis L, Genesis N of Spanish MSAT EA, and FOSSAT 1 and FOSSAT 2 of FOSSA systems. The Cubic Pico satellite experiment would be supported by a network of 350 terrestrial satellite stations, SATNOGs, that had already been developed during a previous venture by the Libre Space Foundation, which we have mentioned before, and talked to the SATNOGs folks. It is an experiment that is taking place in the framework of the amateur radio service to make it accessible to everyone. Recently, in collaboration with Forth, they have undertaken the SIDLOC, Spacecraft Identification and Localization Project, which is funded by the European Space Agency. The basic aim of this venture is to also to trace satellites in space and to solve issues of congestion. Yeah, Starlink. Their organization supports the free sharing of information through open source code and software, that are exchanged on the internet at no cost, free of intellectual property rights. So cool, lots of satellite stuff. And it is getting busy up there. And this came from a, a journal, I guess, called uh, Ekaterini. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. Ekaterini, yeah. which Sounds is close a, enough. It's a Greek <laughs> word for something. Um, but there you go. See, I told you, this is what we have to do. Nigeria, Greece. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Rolling Philippines. Out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so apparently, from what I found, this was also an AWRL in G July. Um, Peter Joe's said almost every day we hear the massive, spiteful, and provocative broadcasts. In June, they used more frequencies than before, affecting our bands very hard. It's a great annoyance and big shame. Um, they have no opportunity to stop the on-air conflict. Uh, let's see here. Um, in May, Joss reported the radio war has raged for years. It's 7055, as well as 7050 and 7060. Uh, he said the continued daily transmissions from Russian over the horizon radar known as container in the 40 and 20 meter amateur bands and elsewhere. The Chinese V, or 5, whatever it may be, has been reported on 20 meters from 14.246 to 14.256. So it right. sounds like there's all kinds of issues going on there. So Yep, all all happening in the IARU Region 2, you know, CW, or not CW, but amateur bands. So big right. fun. Yeah, and I think those are voice bands for Region 1, so. Oh, even down on 7055, that's that's voice over there? Yeah, I think there starts somewhere around 7050 and then creeps up to like 7090 or something like that. Ah, okay. That's why you got to work splits on 40 to work uh, some DX. Yeah, fair enough. All right, Bill, here we go. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one, uh, I thought it was a joke at first because of being Halloween time, but uh, here it is. Debian's a witch hunt, and it's not the witch that screeches through the air right about this time of year. It's the other witch that probably everybody has used at one point in time in the command line. Uh, let's see. So here's the story. So one does not normally expect to see a great deal of angst over a one-page shell script, even on the Internet. But Debian is special in many ways. <laughs> so it has uh, been having an extended discussion over the fate of the witch command that has been escalated to the Debian Technical Committee. The amount of attention that has been given to a small, non-standard utility shines a light on Debian's governance processes and the interaction of traditional, tradition with standards. This long present tool is often used at the command line to locate the binary for programs. Uh, scripts also use it for similar purposes or to determine whether a given program is available at all. For many users, which has a long been baked into muscle memory and is used reflexively uh, at need. For all that, which is not a standardized component of the Unix-like systems, POSIX does not acknowledge its existence. For that reason, among others, there are a number of implementations of which, each differing in its own special ways. Many distributions ship the GNU version of which, for example, with its characteristic long list of options. FreeBSD has its own version. Some shells also implement which as a built-in command. Debian ships yet another version in the form of an aforementioned one-page shell script. It is part of the Debian utils package. In the resulting voting, two of the members, Bremner and Elena, 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 Elena Hashman, voted for the resolution without the removal of the deprecation warning. All of the members were in favor of the whole thing. The resolution thus passed. Adam has... Adams has been overridden and which stays within Debian utils without the warning for now. Assuming that a home for which and temp file, which is another thing you can use, uh, can be found in another essential package, though the path is clear for them to transition out of the Debian utils before the Debian 12 release. All of this may seem like a big fuss over a tiny program, and that is indeed what it is. But it is also a statement of how the Debian project wants changes like this to be made. Debian developers have nearly absolute control over their packages, but there are mechanisms in place to intervene when one developer exercises that control in a way that appears damaging to the distribution as a whole. This sort of witchcraft, haha, witchcraft, spelled wrong, is uh, how Debian has managed to keep hundreds of independent-minded developers working toward a common goal for the better part of three decades. And that story came from LWN. And uh, the survey uh, that was sent out is also linked in the show notes. Uh, and yes, for my part, I use Witch probably six times a day. <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah, basically to find the fully qualified path of a, a binary. Usually, that's what I use it for. So, you know, because I know the binary exists, I just don't know if I happen to be using one that was installed in the system locations or perhaps in local or something like that. So. Yeah, or you want to see which one you're using, like which one's picked up by the path first. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, which is quite useful, and I had no idea that there was this kerfuffle over which. <laughs> yeah, it was a surprise to me as well. <laughs> I, I just use the command, and I don't think about whether it's a binary, a shell script, or, or anything like that, as long as it returns the information I need, that's all I care about. So, and I don't, I don't remember ever seeing a deprecation warning. So, I haven't. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Cheryl, do you want to do one more? Maybe <laughs> get her out of her golden slumbers. <laughs> oh, I'm ignoring you. Why that's are okay. you ignoring me? Because I'm cleaning up email. <laughs> <laughs> all right fine I'll, I'll read this one though bill might have some uh editorializing to do i'm not sure <laughs> so this is a story called run mac os software on linux using darling we have wine a free and open source compatibility layer that helps us to install and run applications and games developed for windows on linux and unix like operating systems we also have an emulator named dosbox to run good old ms dos games and defunct c++ compilers like turbo c++ and linux what about macOS software? Have you ever, well, macOS software is free BSD, isn't it? Have you ever wondered <laughs> how to run applications specifically for Mac under Linux? That's what we're going to do now. This guide explains how to run macOS software on Linux operating systems using Darling Runtime Environment. Darling is a translation layer that allows us to run 
macOS applications on Linux. It emulates a complete Darwin environment, including mock D Y L D. I was going to try and pronounce that, but I'm just not. <laughs> uh, launch D and everything you'd expect. It lets you to ins- it lets you to instantly it lets you instantly switch to a bash shell and start running the application built for Mac OS in your Linux system. Darling is very similar to Wine. Wine allows you to run Windows apps on Linux. Darling lets you run Mac OS software on Linux. Good thing is Darling doesn't violate Apple's EULA because it only uses the parts of Darwin version that are released as fully free software. The name Darling comes from the combination of Darwin and Linux. As you probably know, Darwin is the core operating system of Mac OS and iOS. Darling is free and open source software released as GPL v3. And this came from OS Techniques or Technics. And there's a link to the GitHub repo where you can get Darling if you want to give this a shot. Cool. Yeah. I can't think of a thing I'd use it for, but. <laughs> yeah, me either. <clears throat> because usually but there's cool, a Linux yeah. native version of whatever you want to run on Mac OS. So generally speaking. Maybe you can run GarageBand or something. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Okay. You know what? I was I was kind of a big fan of iMovie, but now that I've been playing around with Caden Live, I much prefer it. So. Oh yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> All right, and uh, next one. Uh, we'll let Bill go ahead and do the next one. We're into our Linux in the Ham Shack segment, and I think this only sort of barely fits in there, but you know we were short on stories, so there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Kraken SDR. Kraken. Release the Kraken. Kraken SDR phase coherent SDR with five RTL SDRs hits crowd supply. Kraken RF has launched a new project via the crowd supply website for their new Kraken SDR phase coherent software defined radio with five RTL SDRs. The project has already raised over $200,000 thanks to over 500 backers with still 30 days remaining. A coherent radio allows for very interesting applications such as radio direction finding, passive radar, and beam forming. To get started using the Kraken SDR, you will require a USB Type-C cable, a 5-volt, 2.4-amp plus uh, USB Type-PC or USB Type-C power supply and antennas, such as the company's magnetic whip antenna set or an antenna that is appropriate for uh, to your application. From the company, uh, we quote here, we've already obtained all the long lead time parts for the first batch of a 1,000 Kraken SDRs, so the first batch will ship out in about six months before any others. If you back the project during the campaign, even if you are not in the first 1,000, you'll save $100 off the re- the eventual retail price of $399. And that came from Geeky Gadgets. Yeah, pretty straightforward there. Interesting five RTL SDR is built onto one board. So that, that might be cool for a, you know, a system to do multiple, uh, VFOs, you know, under like SDR plus plus or something like that. Or any yeah, diversity receiving or something like that. Right. Yeah. Or any number of other projects that might benefit from having multiple radios on a single board. So I saw that as loosely amateur radio relevant because I mean, certainly it's going to be used by somebody to do something cool. So. <laughs> Um, all right. And I just threw in here for purposes of maybe generating a short discussion. KDE doesn't suck. Maybe, <laughs> uh, I've been using KDE plasma screen, you know, desktop environment, like for the last few days after not having used it in probably 10 plus years, because <laughs> once upon a time I considered it like really heavyweight and bloated and ugly and just not very good when compared to the direction GNOME was going. And now GNOME's got its own issues. So I tried a couple of distributions where KDE was the default desktop environment. And then I started installing it on my Ubuntu machines. And I've kind of flipped over to it because I'm really enjoying it. And uh, yes, Bill, I did actually get the wobbly windows and exploding, <laughs> and explode on clothes and all that kind of stuff turned on the genie effect and, and all that cool stuff. And, you know, changed, uh, changed the way it looks, changed everything to like a glass appearance and semi-transparent with, uh, cool icons. And yeah. So. And, and of course you installed the sweet global theme, right? No, I did not do that. Oh, you got to do that. That's the colors. That's the colors you want. Sweet. Sweet. So like S W E E T. Yep. 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 
You can thank me later. <laughs> All right. And the other thing, I don't know that this is specifically KDE, but there's a there's a pop down terminal called, and I I'm gonna pronounce this wrong. I know it. It's either Yaquake or Yakuake. <laughs> um, mm, tasty. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll spell Yakusobi, it. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's Y A K U A K E, and uh, I don't think I can live my life without it anymore. It's just so handy. You can specify the keystroke that generates it. It creates a a terminal of any size and window on command just by you know pressing whatever the hotkey is. It drops down from the top of the screen. You do whatever you want. Then you can either hit the hotkey again or close it. And it just goes away. Or if you exit out of the terminal, it goes away. And then you hit the hotkey again, and it's there again. So just for mm. the, you know, that one time you need to run a quick command in the terminal, and you don't want to, like, you know, go down to your start button or go down to your taskbar and click on the terminal, wait for it to come, blah, 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 blah. You just hit the hotkey, type the command, and boom. It's, it's like, so handy for me, and I'll and I'll use it for everything, even on non-KDE systems. It's just very cool. So yeah, sounds really cool. Um, you you've uh, been playing around with KDE lately too. Anything that sort of stands out for you? Yeah. So uh, on my uh, Shack computer, of course, I'm running Guru to Linux, and that's the Dragonized version that came with KDE, and that kind of got me into using it all the time. And uh, I did install KDE on my Fedora laptop upstairs because I was running into some weird video uh, performance playback issues in GNOME 40. And some people recommended on that particular box to uh, switch over to KDE, and uh, it seems to operate a lot better. I do have to say that the um, the high DPI stuff is uh, a little bit more not as clear. Everything looks like just a little bit like weirder, but it's 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 usable. It's not bad because <laughs> that that's that laptop with the the 4K display or something like that, so it has to uh, you know has to go up 200 percent or whatever so it's all readable because <laughs> it's only a whatever 13 and a half inch screen or something like that but it does performance wise it runs really well i think i didn't like kde back when they used to ship it with a bunch of default uh folder widgets on the screen and stuff like that i don't know if you remember that but it just had a lot of stuff you had to undo and i think the base installs now generally have nothing turned on except for just some very minimal, you know, top bar and stuff like that. So it allows you to customize it a little bit more yourself instead of forcing some early customization choices um, that maybe you didn't want to. And like, that's what I recall as my big hate for KDE was the, the stupid folder widgets that would show up on the screen and stuff like that. And I generally don't like having any icons at all on my desktop. Uh, for at least Linux boxes. So um, I was able to achieve that without any effort now. So I really like it. Yeah. And I also noticed today that there's the, there's like a little notification panel. It's, it's just shows like by a little Chevron right next to the clock in the lower right. It's really unobtrusive, but if you bring it up, it, it links you to a whole mess of stuff that's really useful. And I even find their software center, the way they, the way they sort of aggregate the, and, and allow searching of the applications in the repos, um, really nice as well, sort of better than the way GNOME does it. So, and I also really like the color coding, the folder and file color coding inside of Dolphin. So I, yeah, I'm just, I'm really finding a lot of like st stuff to like about KDE. So. Um, I'm probably going to be using it for a while going forward until it pisses me off again and I'll switch back to something else. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, until you want something that's not so, you know, wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and I will say that I'm running I'm running it on a bunch of different machines, the lowest power to which is like a something gen core i3 with like 4 gigs of RAM and U Intel UHD graphics, and it works just fine on there, no issues at all. So... It, it cool. doesn't seem to be the resource hog that it used to be, and it, it seems to leverage whatever kind of hardware or video acceleration you have, no matter how poor or good it is, really well. So, And in the chat room, Jonathan, W5AJQ, says, so when you run Ubuntu with KDE, are you installing Kubuntu? Uh, I did not stall, install Kubuntu, like, from bare metal. You can do that, and that will give you the KDE desktop experience, or... If you're already running Ubuntu, you can install the meta packages kubuntu-desktop, and that will install everything you need. And then, of course, in your desktop switcher, like when on your login page, 
when you put in your username down in the lower right, there's a gear icon, and that allows you to switch which desktop environment you're going to be logging into, and uh, your KDE will show up there. And in my case, it showed up as uh, KDE Wayland and KDE X, so you could use either one. Yeah, and on Fedora, I just installed, uh, they have a group install package for uh, the KDE desktop environment uh, that makes it super easy. Just a sudo DNF group install, the at symbol, and then KDE dash desktop dash environment. And it worked, yeah, flawlessly. Same thing. Go to the gear on the login and switch your switch your desktop or windowing environment. So, yeah, works great. Yeah, that that is sort of a hidden thing. They've made it very unobtrusive to the point where you wouldn't notice it unless you knew it was there. So I will say if you've never actually installed more than one desktop environment or um, like window manager on a machine, you probably never knew it was there. But basically you have to go, you have to like click on a user or get to the point where you're at uh, the password entry. And then you'll see the little gear icon in the lower right. And that's what you click on to, to switch your environment. So, yeah, cool stuff. And uh, I'm going to go play some more with KDE. <laughs> Sweet. All right. So let's bring Cheryl in now. And she can't back out and say she's doing email because this is her thing now. So social media roundup is here and it's your time to shine. Okay. This is me shining. <laughs> oh no, the shining! I'm about to get hit with an axe. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So. <laughs> How appropriate! <laughs> All right, so moving along <clears throat> for our Patreons, we have Gary Tibbetts, Bryce Johnston, David Scarf, David Slaughter, Jim Lawson, Patrick Ang, Douglas Shock, Eric Guth, Brandon Rosick, John Spriggs, Robert Lewis, Robert Pitts. Douglas Rudder, David Jagway, Darren King, Cubicle Nate, Erno Costala, Samuel Vimes, Peter Caffrey, Richard Gordon, Paul Griffith, Jonas Rulo, Donald Gever, Herb Garcia, Steve Sainer, Steve Metcalf, William Heckelman, Randolph Smith, and Andy Webster. For our subscriptions, we have Bob Allberg. He's new. Welcome aboard. We have Paul Mooney. We have Chris DeLuca, Andy Cowley, Eric Muller, Carl Backus, Isaac Gear, Thomas Foy, Michael Bradak, Kevin Ivey, Tony Coberly, Ronald Ike, Johnny Kinsey, Peter Spots, Fred Cole, Bill Piotr, Jeffrey Boris, Robert Halliday, Wayne Hale, John Clark, Steve Epler, Michael Jopling, uh, Howard Dittmer, Todd Bowers, Michael Carey, A. Taylor, Dylan Angle, Jim McKenzie, Bill Collins, Robert Black, Darren King, Randolph Smith, Robert Yerke, Steve Biella, Helen Wilson, Mark Farrell, and Jeff Zimmerman. On Facebook, Joel Limp- Limpicki and Chris Smart joined us. On Twitter, <coughs> excuse me, we added at VU3Joy, at PD1BER, at Talaga underscore New York City, or NYC, excuse me, at G7VGY, at Agi underscore M0IGA, and at Gerald N88311212. Uh, for YouTube, Mike ZL1PHX, Shane Sova, Mike McDonald. On Discord, we had Dodger276254, W6BZY Ken. And W-U-2-S. Nobody on the mailing list, no merchandise sales. All right. Well, you know what? That means we've come to the end of the show. It's a wrap on another Short Topics episode. And even though we did record on a weird night, we had quite a few people show up to listen to the live broadcast. So we want to mention them here and thank them for being a part of the program. We had Ted, W-A-0-E-I-R, Steve K-7-H-B-T. Jonathan W5AJQ, Mike K6GTE, Ed N2XDD, and Darren VK6EK, all the way from down under. So thanks, everybody, for being here tonight, and thanks to all of those who download the show and listen after the fact and who support us financially to help keep the lights on. We really appreciate you. And if you would, if you've got an interesting project you're working on or anything like that or just anything you want to tell us, feedback, positive or negative, we'd love to hear from you. We have an email address, info at lhspodcast.info. We have a voicemail line, 1909-547-7469, which is also 1909-LHS-SHOW. We'd love to hear from you. Send us some feedback. Otherwise, we hope you have a great week, and we will have a deep dive episode coming for you next. So make sure to tune in for that. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get on out of here. Hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. 
not Thanksgiving, the great Halloween. <laughs> Thanks, Thanksgiving's coming up. We'll we'll say that when we get there. So uh, unless you're listening to this on Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. Just in case, right. <laughs> and Merry Christmas. <laughs> okay, let's get on out of here. This has been episode number 438 of Linux in the Hamtack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD73.